So good morning, everyone, and welcome to a 12 series package lecture to enable you pass your principles of taxation um, under the ICA course. Uh, so this class is useful for the ICAG exams and your normal accounting um, undergraduate uh, program that involves taxation. So um, it, it is going to be in a playlist form for a 12 lecture series. And I can guarantee you that if you are able to follow suit and learn your way through this 12 lecture series, the, standard, the chance of becoming the highest scoring person in the ICA exam, because the lecture is structured in a way that uh, it will enable you to deal with all the questions that come your way uh, in your ICA exams. So uh, let's start with some historical introduction. And you know, um, there are so many uh, sources of history, uh, books that people have written about uh, how tax commenced in the nation Ghana. So this course is really restricted to Ghana taxation. Okay, so we are looking at taxation in reference to um, Ghana laws. But let, let, let's do a little bit of history, um, a little bit of historical introduction. So how, how did it all start in the nation Ghana? Um, so as you can see, I've shared some historical basis here. And it says that the, the modern day taxation was introduced in Ghana uh, during the colonial rule. We are talking about the times where um, the foreigners, we, we had the Portuguese, we have the Danish, we, we, we had the, the, the United Kingdom, the English coming to Ghana to, I mean, uh, rule in a colonial fashion. All right, and when they came in, uh, probably tax is way back. It was practiced in their lands, so they came in um, and brought the concept here into our nation, Ghana. Of course, it was not known as Ghana before, but the Gold Coast. Uh, but upon their arrival, you could see that there there were some uh, battle, power battle fighting in our nation, and and amongst them were the the Ashantis, um, the Achim, the Aquemus, and the Dentres. All right. So these were things we've known in our social study class. I mean, in our JHS um, encounter of history, we learned these things. So uh, there was this pattern of fighting to own lands. Uh, this you fight, you win. And it dates back the days of um, of the Bible, like to have power, you need to go and conquer a land, and the land has the land become yours. Okay, and that, that is what was happening. So you see, the pattern was of land changing hands, and depending on who took over, the new ruler came with a whole a system of levying some imposition. So if you are the landowner, then you have the authority to impose some uh, impositions. Um, some kind of contribution that you would take. And um, usually they were farm produce and stuff. Uh, so according to uh, Adeiga 2013, uh, you could see that these things date back in the 18th century. And of course, uh, we know that in the Gold Coast, uh, it started in the form of indirect tax. And that is how it was introduced in the system of Ghana. So, uh, so according to Akoto, uh, you, th that is the concept, that is what he tells us. He tells us that the, the taxation in the Gold Coast was introduced first in the form of an indirect tax. And this was in the form of a custom duty payment that was levied on goods and services. And it was it was a 0 0.5 ad valerium tax that was charged, all right? So when we start going into... Um, uh, steps we will discuss all these ad valerium tax system and all those stuff. And and it so happened that in April, uh, and this one we all know, in April 1852, we talk about the British rule and the introduction of the poll tax ordinance. Uh, if you remember where 
uh, every person was supposed to pay one shilling per head. So it doesn't matter whether you were born today or you were born yesterday or you were born 100 years ago. So far as you exist, it was one shilling uh, per head. And the initiative and the introduction was by uh, Governor Major S. G. Hills. We know in our social study history. All right. And here it was kind of a fixed amount that is levied on. So you see, we, we move from uh, what Adeiga is telling us and what Mr. Akuto is telling us, the introduction of this tax system coming in the form of an indirect tax. All right. So, and then you move on to payment of one shilling uh, per head and uh, per head per year. So you pay your one shilling. Of course, I, I wasn't born then. And so I, I don't even know the value of one shilling. Probably in these days, it can be 100 cities comparative or, uh, or whatnot. All right. And, and the reasons that, that history tells us that uh, the people that they use for the mechanism for collection, uh, collection of these taxes were mainly the chiefs. All right. They were mainly the chiefs. And because you see, um, so the chief collects the money. And that is where, uh, in research, people have done the moderating role of trust uh, affecting the behavior of uh, theory of planned behavior, the elements, uh, uh, trust being a moderating role. Uh, because for you to collect these taxes, you can't come from your foreign land and start levying tax on people because they don't know you. And they use the Ghanaians, our own Ghanaians, to start collecting the tax at the back of a promise of one. They wanted to collect tax and use the money to provide health facilities, education, and other amenities for the people. So they use the chiefs, all right? And, and clearly, as you see here, so the chiefs were the major collecting machinery. And these days, of course, we have, uh, uh, it has grown from these, uh, we have the we 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 we, we had the uh, internal revenue service even not long ago, uh, before 2015, and uh, sorry before 2009, and 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 the late president, His Excellency Atamios, uh, for blessed memory, uh, brought all these concepts together in 2009 to form um the Ghana Revenue Authority. All right, that one I I was so much, yes alive to see it and grown to see it. All right, so uh, what you see here is that they, they, they promised this and they wanted to use the tax and, and they used the chiefs. And record says that uh, in August, they started in April, but in August to July, uh, uh, the next year, which is the year of assessment that they started with, um, they, they, they had, 460,656 pounds, you can imagine. Of course, we were under the colonial rule. So pounds is the currency uh, we dealt with. And, and it seemed promising at the start as we, we've been told, um, but what happened was that when they realized, the, the leaders, the chiefs realized that uh, uh, they were actually not using the money to build the school, but they were using the money to pay salaries of the high British uh, officers, uh, they became fed up and that led to the collapse of the whole tax system. All right, so in the 1943, um, the effect of the World War was brutal and even Ghana, which was known for cocoa, uh, had a price uh, coming down for 30 pounds per ton. All right, and, and, and records also says that the government needed about 800,000 to finance some budget deficit. So it says that there was a drastic cut in the expenditure, uh, which, which would slow down development. Uh, as we see these days, our government is bent on spending because they see that that is the means of development. So the governor, Alan Benz, therefore introducing a tax bill, it was a drafted tax bill, and in fact, it went for protests, uh, speeches were made to official uh, legislative council, and Ghana then recorded our first consolidated tax uh, system in 1943. So we have 19, the 1943 income tax ordinance, and it was passed in September, which became effective in April the next year. All right. So 
uh, it's had the graduated tax system that we've come to know. So if you earn uh, between your, your first 20 pounds, you pay three pence, okay? And it is in pound, all right? But if you, if you exceed uh, uh, 10,000, then you'll be paying seven shillings and six pence, all right? So that is that. And record puts it that uh, at the end of that year of assessment, which is uh, March 31st, 1945, uh, they had 1,230,916 uh, uh, pounds. All right, so that is what happened. That was the administrative administration of it. All right, and we all know that uh, uh, kind of set to say that that would have formed the first consolidation, uh, form the first consolidated income tax in government. It, it seemed not because. Um, then starts the approach of um, we becoming Ghana, all right? And, and that went through some amendments. So there were a series of amendments, like the way you see these days, series of amendments, okay? So once we brought all those amendments together, it now come to form um, the first consolidated tax system, tax ordinance to be published because you have this tax here, tax system here, you have this amendment here, you have this amendment here. So you bring all of them together and it now gives us our major first consolidated income tax ordinance, which is published in 1953. And don't forget at this time, we are gearing towards independence, okay? So that is how it happened. Okay, so that was published in 1953. And um, uh, that one too had amendments, started with amendment 68, um, in 1961, had amendment uh, 173, uh, one, 179, uh, two years later, and another two years later, we have an, we had another amendment, uh, 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 amendment 312, also in 1965. So that was how the tax system or the tax laws were, were evolving. Now we've had independence and we are under military rule and of course on the central revenue department, like today's GRA, that was the name then, okay? And, and, and there was a, a second major consolidation. Uh, that one is under the uh, kind of uh, the overthrowing system, Nkrumah system, all those, all, all, all those things, all right? So the Nkrumah system, uh, we brought in another consolidated uh, tax system, okay? Another consolidated tax system. So. Uh, that, that kind of military or negotiated takeover from the British calls on us to start forming our own system, all right? So by negotiation, we all know the UK left and uh, we are now Ghana. So we have the Nkrumah system uh, coming up with a whole system of tasks, which is the Central Revenue Department, all right? And they came in and on then comes another consolidated tax in the in the SMCD uh, time. So SMCD 5 in, published in 1975, another tax system, which was still collected by the central revenue government. And in, I think in 2000, uh, that is the one that I wrote under, um, in 2000, we had an, our fourth consolidated at the IRS and 592. Um, also at this time, we the name of the central revenue department was actually a internal revenue service and that was for. And now we, in 2015, um, we had the income tax at 896. So that, that is how our tax system have evolved. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have the information that there is going to be a set one because the amendments have been plenty. We need to consolidate and a whole new tax system. My head is ongoing, all right? So if you have to pass this one fast, pass it out, all right? Okay, so that is that. Now let's come to um, definition of tax. Definition of tax. Okay, so um, literature explains uh, tax uh, before the uh, the postmodern. So we 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 have the premodern uh, to be um, a compulsory contribution, which was done, and most importantly, so we had the con compulsory uh, contribution.
and it's surmounted to a specific benefit. All right, so it, it so happened that in the post-modernity, if, if you really don't need the benefit that will be provided by the government and you can have it yourself, uh, you don't need to pay tax. And so a major issue then were uh, like security. So you contribute like the way uh, government employ police for on our behalf of the general nation, government employs the Navy, government em employs the military to protect us as a nation. So it was, so the more you pay, the more protection you had. But guess what? If somebody had the money and could pay the military services himself, he doesn't need to give the money to the government. And if you remember, there have been issues such as um, um, uh, corporate social responsibility. Why pay tax? Why not use the money to perform the act directly? All right. So, I mean, these are issues that have popped up. Okay. So in the pre-modern definition uh, uh, tax, uh, uh, you see that the focus was the direct benefit that a person gets. Okay. But in the post-modern definition, we have definition of the law coupled with uh, uh, the, the ones that we've known internationally. Okay. So um, when we talk about tax, uh, according to the section nine of our of our Revenue Administrative Act 915, 2016, it defines tax as a duty, a levy, uh, a charge, a rate, a fee, a fine, interest, penalty, or any other amount imposed by law or to be collected or paid to the Commissioner General. So um, the key focus here is, is the administration by the Commissioner General. Commissioner General. And of course, uh, bringing in the modern uh, uh, correlation in terms of the pre-modern definition and the modern definition, uh, it talks about no direct benefit. No direct benefit. Okay, so these, these are two key uh, concepts that explain uh, the current day taxation that we have. So let, let me give you an example. Um, so on, I, I am in Tema, and on the motorway to Accra, there is a toll. Okay, there's a toll booth. And what we know the toll booth for is they, they, they take tolls and they use it for the maintenance of the road. That is the generic understanding, as in uh, whether they do that is another. So you could see that when you pay the toll, it is giving you access to pass, to use the road. Another thing that you realize is that you are having a direct benefit. And so therefore, uh, you could see this one is not administered by the Commissioner General. You don't pay the money to the Commissioner General. And therefore, per this definition, this is not a tax. This is not a tax. So um, if you go to DVLA and you pay them any money and, and, and they give you your license, it is in a direct benefit of you taking your license okay and it is not administered by the commissioner general it is not the commissioner general that is taking the money so herein it is not a tax go to the mmdas the monies that our mothers pay and all those things since it is not collected by the commissioner general administered by law even though it's compulsory and it is collected and you are having a direct benefit it is not administered by the commissioner general it does not befit the definition of tax all right so that is something that you need to um, take care and understand, all right? So be careful in trying to define taxation. And so um, Abdullah 2006 uh, says that tax is a levy of compulsory contribution by public authorities having that tax jurisdiction to defray the cost of their activities, all right? And Akoto says that uh, it's a financial charge or other levies imposed on an individual or a legal entity by the state, of course, is still uh, that Natya uh, says interestingly that taxation is the, le uh, the levying of compulsory contributions by the public authority having a higher tax jurisdiction to defray the cost of the activity, just like Abdullah says. And he says that the taxpayer has no specific re reward for the payment. The money is collected for common good. All right. So like I explained, that is the modern uh, day definition of taxation. And you need to uh, really appreciate that and be able to um, talk about it. All right. So let's look therefore at the functions of tax. 
the functions of tax. Now, so what do you we use the tax for? Uh, what is the role of taxation? So first of all, we understand that uh, we use tax to um, raise revenue for government expenditure. All right, and this is true. Uh, there are so many literatures that back this that uh, tax is the money that is used to um, um, regulate the activities of an economy or a country. All right, and so therefore, uh, that is a key usage of of tax. Okay, it's a very key usage of tax. All right, so a uh, government has so many functions. Some are political, uh, some are social. Uh, we talk about infrastructure. All right, all these things are, are things that uh, the government needs to do. So we talk about re raising revenue um, to defray some uh, expenditures. And here, like I said, so we are talking about revenue. Of course, tax is a cost to a business by a revenue to the government. So you should understand the social need, okay? All right, so when we talk about this social, we talk about political need, you know, we need to organize elections and all those things. Uh, we talk about uh, what, what we call it, um, uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure projects. All right, so all these things are needed by the government. But more importantly, you need to understand we are talking about electricity in Ghana. We are also talking about what? Education. We are talking about health. Okay, so all these things are questions. You cannot do these things by yourself. You cannot create your own school and start attending. Uh, government has to do that, all right? So you, this is the way we actually put in the money. Of course, a, a typical example is what happened uh, last year, 2022, all right? That uh, the minister came out to say that uh, uh, they need e-levy to be in place so that they can use, to, use the money to construct roads. And so they brought in e-levy, so just to raise revenue. Uh, I mean, as to the, the use of it, uh, just we, we we don't have much to say on that. So just like it happened in 1943, uh, that is the same thing that is happening. Okay, so you have to pay the money into the consolidated fund uh, for government to have it and use it. Okay, so that that is something uh, worth noting. Uh, we also say that tax is used to discourage the consumption of certain goods, especially uh, that which we will learn the classified. And those classified under indirect, all right? So they are, they are taxes on consumption. So how do you explain this? It's discouraging uh, uh, to help discourage the consumption of certain goods. Of course, um, a, a research has to be done on that to see how best Ghana is doing it because there is a key thing in economics called taste and preference. So which it doesn't matter how much you put on it, people still go there. So how do you do that? You increase the taxes on those commodities, alcohol, tobacco, you increase their prices via the use of tax. And we will talk about fiscal policy uh, probably in our next lecture. Okay, so you use the tax and you raise the prices so high, all right? So it will deter people uh, not being able to afford it just to curb uh, the use of these products in the country. And um, we also talk about uh, to bridge the income inequality via redistribution of wealth. Um, and this is very crucial, very, very, very crucial uh, because uh, um, it is said by Adam Smith that a society that has majority of its people in, in poverty is said to be an unjust society. And that is what we need to try and bridge as a nation. So what does the government do? Um, try to bridge the inequality in terms of wealth distribution. So. The, 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 the are tax system, tax types that the government uses. We have the progressive so start that it taxes higher income. So when you earn more, you pay more, all right, using the graduated tax system. And I mean, so government takes these things. So let's say Accra is so developed. Uh, most businesses are in Accra, Tema. And so the, these ones are taxed high. And the money that are obtained here in Accra Tema are sent to the other places to construct their, their schools, to develop jobs so that in terms of wealth creation, it balances. 
Because even though Accra is known for its manufacturing uh, purposes and service purposes, the food that we eat are also coming from uh, places like Sunyane in the plains, all right? So, I mean, there is kind of an exchange. And so, therefore, uh, we need to uh, minimize the gap that is so there. So, if you check the statistics that was released by GRA in 2001, you realize that it had 98% of risk revenue uh, in the form of taxes uh, coming from the greater Accra, greater Accra only. Okay, so, uh, I mean, there has to be some kind of uh, uh, social justice. So all the development doesn't stay here, but has to spread, um, uh, I mean, across the country, okay? So it uses the, the progressive, the proportionate and the regression, regressive tax system, all right? So to help curb this uh, social kind of uh, injustice, all right? So we also talk about using tax system to uh, promote the businesses of indigenous uh, people and prevent dumping. Uh, yes, it's true. Uh, so we know that people import a lot in our country. I mean, uh, if the taxes are high, then it means that the prices of these goods are also high and you, you, you find challenge in people importing. Okay, and that will help save the indigenous who are into the same production as that which are imported. But you see, uh, we, we need to build up our system so that we can produce and match up. You can't stop the bringing in when you yourself, you don't produce that much. Okay, so we need to encourage. And so the imposition of high tariffs of imported goods uh, has the main concept of discouraging importers. Okay, so that here will be a dumping ground. Uh, we will not be just a, um, an imported nation. Well, as to whether we are achieving that, uh, is a question for us to answer. But tax is a tool for us to use to help in this. In the same way, it helps in the fiscal aspect of the economy, especially a balance of payment de deficit. Because when you import more, it means that you have to exchange currency to pay. So tax, as we are increasing to increasing the custom tariffs to discourage people from bringing the thing in, we are also lowering the export so to encourage people to send out so that we would rather have the foreign currency and use what we get out of our exportation to uh, meet what we get, uh, what we owe in our importation, all right, so that it balances off. Once again, as to whether we are being able to achieve these things are questions that we need to ask ourselves. Now, uh, we come to Adam Smith's concept of the canons and and the maxims and the characteristics of or attributes of a good tax system. Uh, it's something I call the ECCE. Uh, so the ECCE talks about economy, certainty, convenience, and equity, all right? So let's look at the first one, which is equity. Well, when we say something is, you no, know, equity is not, doesn't mean equal, all right? We are not saying that everything should be equal. But what we are saying is that there must be a justice of equity, a fair share of your ability to pay. All right. So we say that tax should be based on the ability to pay principle, the ability to pay. All right. It should not be based on uh, any other thing but one's ability to pay. And one's ability to pay is expressed in the how much the person can earn. All right. So the higher, it says that this means that the more money a person earns the higher ability he has to pay and vice versa. And that is the ability to pay concept, okay? So uh, we are saying that to be equitable, to be fair, it should be proportionate on one's income, all right? So that is that. Is that. So we're talking about equity. So we are not saying we should pay equal taxes, but I mean, based on what? The ability to pay, that is the main concept, ability to pay. And so we are saying that it should be proportionate on income. All right. And so that is that. So for example, as you see here, uh, to illustrate uh, this, we say that imagine all Ghanaians pay 10,000 a year in income tax, regardless of their income. In this case, the millionaire who earns 1 million uh, can have easy, uh, easy money. He can pay the 10,000. Uh, but compared to the person who is making 20,000, he will be left with 1,000. And so you need to, I mean, 
check um, what kind of equity inside it, all right? So, so that is what we are talking about, all right? But when we talk about equity, we have two main concepts under equity. We have the horizontal equity. And we have the vertical equity. All right, so what is the horizontal? We all know a horizontal line is drawn like this and a vertical line is drawn like this. So what, what does that show you? It shows you that if we have two people who are on this same line, uh, they should be paying yeah, some kind of similar or equal taxes if their conditions are the same. All right, so this is based on the idea that um, those who are on the same amount of wealth or similar levels of income should be paid the same rate as tax, all right? So for example, if two people earn 50,000, and receive the same tax bill, 10,000, then the concept is said to be horizontally equitable. So uh, we are on the same, our conditions are the same, we should be paying the same kind of taxes, all right? But it is said that indeed, it is very difficult to achieve when uh, taxes them like the one that we have in Ghana have good rules and, and deductions, all right? So, uh, that is that is it. But the concept of horizontal equity is that people who are on the same income level, the same economic situation, should be paying the same rate as tax. All right. So then we talk about the vertical. All right. So the vertical is talking about the higher that you earn, the higher that you can pay. All right. So it should be proportionate on such. Okay. So if we say that we are paying ten percent, then it means that the mind if I earn one million my 10% will be like 100,000. And if I'm earning 1,000, then I also should pay a 10% a, a of 100, all right? So that is how uh, it should be so that it can be kind of vertically horizontal, uh, equitable uh, to people, okay? All right, and it says that proponents of this system believe that uh, wealthier individuals benefit from the government services and should therefore be responsible for paying more. Like we said, uh, they, they enjoy more, they buy the cars, they use the road more than uh, you are walking, they are using the roads, all right? So, I mean, they should be able to uh, pay more tax, all right? So that, that's, that's that. And we talk about certainty. What is certainty? Certainty means that there should be some clear way of knowing the amount that you have to pay. So, I mean, the tax laws should be clear, so that everybody who has some kind of knowledge in tax should be able to calculate their tax. It doesn't have to be a brokerage compliance all the time. What do I mean by brokerage? Uh, the system where people will use uh, other people to be able to comply. You have to see a tax consultant like myself uh, to be able to comply. All right. So, I mean, there should, you should have a fair knowledge. Okay. You should have a fair knowledge. If you look at the typology of compliance, uh, uh that we have the deterrence we have we, we we have this brokerage system uh where people have to use but there should be some kind of uh basic knowledge everybody should ha have about us i call uh on policy makers to see how they can put these uh voluntary compliance system in the syllabuses probably in social studies in the the lower level I mean, uh, in, and in senior high school, put it in social studies concept of taxation so that by the time you come up, you have some fair knowledge about your responsibility to uh, be paying tax. But as um, my, my lecturer will say, uh, will say, tax is not an expense. It is your contribution to the national wealth, all right, so that uh, you, it can be returned back to you indirectly in terms of the advancement of the nation. All right, so uh, uh, that is that. So you should have some kind of certainty. I mean, the law should not be so ambiguous. Uh, and 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 these days, our tax officers, the way the way they stress taxpayers, I mean, and so people are losing the the confidence in even uh, filing their taxes or exposing themselves uh, that they even exist for them to be. Uh, tax because of the behaviors of of these offices all right um yes this is coming from literature yes it is happening so it's not like 
we are leaving. I'm sorry, probably you will be working in GRA and you want to pursue this course and you are saying these things. But it, it is from literature. Literature has exposed these things onto us. All right, then we talk about convenience. Okay, so the timing and the method of payment should also, uh, the medium of payment should also be convenient. Uh, it is said in those days that GRA used to be in the form of LTO, MTO, and the STO. I came to see some, uh, and I used to file on the LTO. So, uh, and these things in the IR, IRS Act, uh, we, we, we learned about it being that uh, if you have revenues, uh, uh, I think the range was 500,000 or 1 million upward, you have to pay out the LTO. So imagine the LTO was just one office in Accra, the one that got bent around circle. So imagine uh, you are in Boga, and as Alina Chia points it, uh, you have to travel all the way to Accra to pay tax. I mean, this, this is so inconvenient. So inconvenient. What if on your way you are robbed? But you could see these days that we are using the taxpayer's portal. The taxpayer's portal, uh, we reference that uh, people use the Ghana.gov to make all payments. Such convenience, all right? And that is a, something that is so good uh, for people to uh, use and to be able to. Because sometimes you go, you get there at five o'clock, said they are closing. I mean, such inconvenience. So, so much queues. You have to join a queue to pay tax. I mean, and your work is there. So these are all the things. And we are talking about economy. And economy is the main reason why a nation like Ghana is having serious collections. So uh, you see the, the cost in collecting the tax should not exceed the amount that you receive out of the, the exercise, okay? And that is why they don't conduct audits most times uh, because the cost, the fuel cost and all those things. Um, I mean, so it, it should be less to administer, but more revenue should be coming in. You can't, your cost should not exceed your revenue. And, and so that is the economy aspect of what we are talking about. So to illustrate this, uh, imagine that the collection of income tax was costly and accounted for 90% of all revenues, then it means that government only had 10% of revenue. In this case, it is not economical, all right? So these are the illustrations you give when you are asked to talk about the attributes of the tax system. Never explain an attribute without giving an example. You will lose the mark, all right? So please take note of that, take note of that. Of course, we have other ones like flexibility as the system is changing these days, AI is technology, our tax law should be able to um, adjust itself uh, in terms of the ongoing technology, all right? Efficiency, I mean, there has to be some kind of professionalism, uh, providing a one-stop touch uh, uh, to tax collection, okay? So, I mean, so much efficiency. You, 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 you don't leave taxpayers at the verge of struggles, okay? All right, so, um, so there should be smooth flow of this implementation of that some kind of quality professionalism uh, in, in tax collection. Okay, so these are the six main, um, the four main ECC is coming from Adam Smith, but other ones like flexibility and efficiency, your productivity, okay, so how you explain it matters, but don't forget the ECCE, all right? Equity, convenience, certainty, economy, those are the big four. And then you add flexibility and efficiency. All right, so that is that. So now we look at uh, what we call um, tax incidence analysis. Tax incidence analysis, um, which is coming from the incidence theory. Okay, so the incidence theory uh, is an economic term for us to understand the division of tax burden. Um, among stakeholders who bears the tax, um, the, the, the tax effect, the tax pinch, right? The tax burden. Okay, so that is what the incidence analysis is about. So uh, it talks about the distribution or, uh, or the, it examines the distribution of the overall tax burden amongst 
the selling and the buying, the business aspect of an economy. So we are talking about the shiftings, how the tax burden moves, all right, how it moves or changes uh, in, the, in the chain of uh, demand and supply. All right, so that is what we are referring to when we talk about the incidence analysis. So tax incidence here by, uh, is referred to as the, the burden of tax uh, that is distributed among uh, the, the firms and consumers of an economy, all right? So uh, that is what we are talking about. Okay, so these things really depends on the elasticity of the demand and supply uh, in, in the nation. So you could see if uh, the customer is burdened of tax increase, uh, if prices go up, we all know that the shifting, the indirect nature of it. Uh, producer is also, uh, it says that the producer burden is the decline in revenue, um, which it faces after paying tax. So everybody has an effect, all right? So we look at the two main concepts. We have the impact and the uh, incidence. Don't forget, incidence talks about the transfer of the burden. The incidence. Okay, so when we talk about the impact, we are talking about the pinch. What do we mean by the pinch? The first contact of tax. First contact of tax. Okay, so that is what we are trying to express. So we are talking about the pinch of payment and it expresses the immediate result or the or original imposition of tax. So when the tax is imposed, who suffers first? Who pays it first? All right, so that is what we are trying to talk about. So impact refers to the initial burden of the tax at the point of the imposition. Okay, so let, let's look at an example. Um, take for instance, an excise duty. Okay, so the excise duty, the producer pays first, then puts the duty as part of his pricing system to the consumer. So the first impact of uh, the excise duty is on who? The producer. All right, the producer. And look at payee. Uh, if you are an employee, you see that you are the same person. The first impact is on you. Okay, so the impact of that one is on you. So that is what you need to understand. But when we talk about the incidents, and the incidents therefore now refers to the ultimate resting place. So like we use the excise as an example, uh, or let's say a VAT as an example. You see, these two are indirect taxes. So what happens is that the impact is really on the producer or the manufacturer. Then it, it then move now as in terms of the incidents, they push everything on the customer or consumer. All right, so that is what happened. That is the distinction between the impact and the incidence. All right, so that is that is that that is that. So uh, you could see clearly that like, there's a clear distinction of what we call an indirect income, indirect income tax, and direct income. So you, you can see clearly that in the indirect, the pinch and the incidence is on two different people, but the direct tax, like the pay, the pinch and the incidence is on the same person, all right, the same income. All right, so let's look at the taxable capacity. All right, the taxable capacity. So here we are talking about how much an economy or a country can get from its tax laws. The absolute taxable capacity, the maximum uh, cash or tax a nation can collect. And that is what we are um, trying to explain to you. So what are the factors? What are the factors that determines this? So for definition purposes, we are referring to the maximum paying capacity of an economy or a country as a whole, a region, industry, a, a group or individual, all right? The, the maximum tax they can contribute to the nation. Okay, so uh, that, that is it. But let's look at the factors, the factors. Okay, what are the factors that will increase the amount of uh, the tax? Okay, so it is influenced indeed by various factors. Um, 
at the heart of it is what uh, Fenley uh, Shiraz um, finds uh, in, in this list of major factors. So uh, he talks about um, the number of people in the country. Okay, so he says that the population state of the state um, counts because if the population is large, uh, it means that they can be higher. Uh, taxes and distribution of income and wealth. Okay, and inequality in distribution implies that high relative uh, tax capacity. However, a degree of inequality, if the degree of inequality is reduced, the tax capacity becomes narrow. Yeah, it, it's true. It's true. Okay, so um, I mean, if if it's a small quantum uh, that has the wealth, then that small quantum. Is the one that are going to pay the tax, even though uh, they may be paying high tax, as opposed to uh, everybody having their fair share to control. So it's a concept of elasticity. And the diverse of the tax system also impart uh, the tax capacity than just one single tax. If you have property tax, you have income tax, you have rent tax, all those taxes, the number of taxes can increase how much you can get. So another thing also is that if the purpose of the taxation is welfare programming and the tax capacity tends to be high, of course it is true. And this is where the issue is. We want to see. So it is said that uh, in the vicious cycle of uh, compliance, we have we have the government, we have then the individual, then the government individual. It goes round like that. Now government. Is not having more taxes, complaining. An individual is also saying that when we give you the money, you don't use it transparently, you chop the money. So why should we even give you the tax? So if you are able to be transparent, so transparency is another one, key one, okay, key one. And if you use the thing for welfare for the people, why won't they contribute more? You are not using the money where you call on us to pay you levy. And when we don't pay you levy, I always must ask myself, did our finance, how much did our finance minister contribute as e levy tax? Was he even was he even paying it himself using Momo? So if you don't, how then do you expect people to do it? It's a tax plan. And if I know I will use Momo and you will tax me, then I won't use it at all. I will use it. At all. So the MTN report that says that uh, when they reduced the the e levy. Uh, things started booming up a little. They changed the percentage to one percent. That is the impact. That's the impact. Okay. So, I mean, these are the things. These are the things. Okay. So, if people are more patriotic, uh, the task capacity is high. Of course, uh, uh, we, we said that loyalty is a two way street. You do I do. So you don't misuse my funds and ask me to lawyer. So, I mean, that one, it won't work. All right, so that is that. Then we classify tax into direct and what? Indirect tax. Okay, what is a direct tax? As I explained, it's a, it's a system where the impact and the incidence is on the same person. Okay, so, I mean, the tax that the person submit is directly to the government without including any other third party. All right, so, uh, that is a direct tax, direct tax system. Now, what are the advantages? Of course, it is based on one ability to pay, one's ability to pay, and therefore it promotes what equity. It promotes certainty because we all know, it. I know if I earn this money, I can use the graduated tax system to do the, comput the computation and I know how much I will pay, right? It says that promotes elasticity, how? Because taxes are, uh, it taxes taxes are the earnings of the government, and so they fluctuate. The earnings also change. So if if the earnings go high, you too everything will go high, okay? And it saves time and money. How? Because like the payee to the government, they don't spend more collecting payee tax. Automatically, they've levied the law on the employer in regulation three of the LI two two four four. And the government will automatically, uh, the employer will automatically pay the tax to the government coffers. So save them time and money in terms of collecting it. Uh, and and of course, the the one of the biggest advantage disadvantage is that 
that's the tendency of discouraging people from working hard. Like we said, uh, the higher you earn, the higher you pay. Then why should I earn high and pay high? Of course, that's the lazy man. What are the All right. But the thing is that the more you earn, you are falling into the bigger percentage bracket. All right. Because of its um, uh, progressive nature. Another disadvantage is that uh, it discourages investments. People are not investing because uh, government is going to tax transfer. And, and these days, uh, the minister proposed the 30%. And so businesses are, are being bought over. Uh, I read a paper that said that uh, uh, tax, no matter the size of an entity, uh, contributes 30% of their expenses. So they will try as much as possible uh, to reduce that 30% of their expenses. And that is that is what constitutes the motivation for people to evade the, the payment of their expenses. Okay. All right. So that's, that's that. And um, it says that the direct taxes also reduce the capital availability for companies to reinvest. Of course, we are taking 25% out of your money. 25%. You know how much that thing could have used, kind of the expansion it could have been used for, and all those things. But I mean, as as my lecturer Mr. Tiaku said, which I really agree. If you see it as a an, as an expense, that is where the if you see it as a contribution to your the welfare of the state, then that one helps. All right, so that is that. Um, tax the direct taxes are very annoying to pay. Uh, the reason direct taxes make the taxpayers unwilling to pay because uh, they are well aware of the fact that uh, they are being paid. But this isn't the case of indirect tax. Because you know, and, and, and it's an interesting fact that uh, before, was it 2015 or so, you'll be paying indirect taxes without knowing. When you buy something, you are not even giving a receipt. So you don't even, and even these days where they give receipt, people don't really check the receipt when they buy at shops that there is a on it. I remember going to a restaurant and they gave me the menu and they gave me the prices. So I bought the food, I finished eating. All for me to be told that the prices on the menu are not VAT inclusive and therefore I need to now pay the VAT. They have to work the VAT on it and give it to me and they gave me a, a VAT receipt. Because if I had known, probably it is inclusive and it has increased the price. Maybe I would have gone to a different place. But it's annoying that you know that the income that you are earning, there is tax to be collected on it. But it's, this is purely theoretical concepts, all right? Uh, if you are to use it to explain um, in exams, I, 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 I would count that you put this one to the very last bit of it, okay? And direct taxes may lead to evasion owing to the things that we discuss, all right? And we have the indirect taxes. These are the ones that the impact is on one person, then the incidence falls on the other. And we spoke about that using the excise customs and VAT, all right? So at the disadvantages of, of the direct taxes are the advantages of the indirect taxes. And the advantages of the, uh, of the direct taxes are the disadvantages of the indirect taxes, so you need to be able to correlate it well. Okay, so uh, for the government, it is easier to collect it. Uh, it's based on how much a person can consume, but it, it's not fair in a way in terms of its disadvantage. So let's say a tin of milk is a uh, ten CDs, uh, in which there is a tax. The rich man will go and buy this tin. The poor man is also buying this thing. I mean, they are paying the same tax. They are paying the same tax. But one could say it's your ability to consume. But I, I see it so different. Uh, so we have um, uh, the paying, paying indirect tax is, is not as inconvenient as the, the, the direct tax. Okay, because it has been paid on the final consumer, uh, everything is. So the government takes it earlier before you can even you pay. All right, so that is why we do VAT input and VAT out. All right. And that is the one that is used to control the consumption of harmful products. All right. Okay. 
it is easy to collect. I think I've talked about that. Uh, uh, indirect taxes do not discourage people from working hard online. I mean, this one rather encourages you because you have to work more to get the money to be able to consume. All right. And the concept you talked about uh, helping the indigenous entities, uh, it's the, the major drive is the use of uh, indirect taxes. All right. But it is regressive in nature. Um, it leads to inflation because it makes things very expensive. Yeah. And there is no kind of certainty of how much the GR can have because uh, the accounting of me to spend so that they get. So if I don't spend, they don't get. All right. And it affects the prices of commodities. Okay. So th this is a tabular arrangement of uh, uh, how this thing looks like. As you can see. All right. So I've done a tabulated arrangement for you. The, the direct and the indirect as in terms of definition. Uh, okay, so we are talking about the impact, the incidents, the fact that there is intermediaries paying to the government from the final consumer, the nature of it, uh, the cost involved. Okay, so the burden and all those things. We've discussed these things already. All right, chances of evasion in the indirect as very right? Now let's talk about the tax systems. So we have the progressive tax system, the higher you earn, the higher, uh, sorry, the proportionate. Okay, so it's a fixed percentage, but the higher you earn, the higher you pay, all right? It's, that one is a fixed percentage. Okay, so it's a fraction of your income. So a quick one, as you can see here, all right? So we have John, Jake and Richard. Okay, so these are their incomes, but the fixed rate is 20%. So everybody, pays this percent. So we call it a proportionate income, all right? So it's the same rate on as a fraction of your income. So that is what you see, okay? All right. Then we have the regressive. So the regressive goes like the lower you earn. So this is what you see. So it requires higher income tax base, uh, payment to pay smaller tax fraction on their income. This means that as income rises, your tax rate decreases. So you see the person pay, earning higher will rather, uh, will rather pay less taxes and the person paying lower, uh, earning lower will rather pay high taxes. So it encourages people to uh, uh, work hard and, and get more, it encourage people. So this means that as income rises, tax rates decreases. Now, in reality, we hardly ever see this tax system. It doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen anywhere. I don't know, I have not come across economies. So the more you earn, the less you pay. All right, then we have the progressive, the higher you earn, the higher you pay. That one is what I know. So, so in the nutshell, what we are talking about is that uh, while most uh, people agree that tax is necessary, uh, there is a lot of disagreement on how much bed it one should bear, all right? And it should be designed on one's ability to pay, all right? So uh, that is that, that is that. Now we have the jurisdiction to tax, all right? And the, the two main tax system we are talking about, uh, uh, in Ghana, we have the residence base and we have the source base, we have the hybrid. Now, what is the residence base and what is the tax implication of the residence base? So the residence base is, 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 is trying to explain that uh, so far as you are a resident, it doesn't matter where you earn your money, you have to pay tax on it. So far as you are a resident. Then the definition of being a resident, later we will discuss it uh, when we are trying to talk about the taxation of individuals. But just a clue, you refer to section 101, of the income tax at 896, all right? It talks about how a person becomes resident. So it talks about a person who is a citizen of the country, other than one who is who has a permanent home outside the country and has, and has stayed over, uh, out, or over there or outside the country throughout the basis year of the year of assessment. So you were not here. But so far as you are a citizen, other than that kind of thing, 
yes. then you are resident. Okay. So number two, it also talks about a person who has been in the country for an aggregate period of 183 days or more in a 12 months period that begins or ends uh, uh, in a particular uh, year of assessment, basis period in a year of assessment. All right, so that is that. So if you've been in Ghana for a continuous or aggregate, it's not a continuous, but the word used in the law is aggregate period of 100. All right, so um, that is that. So, and if you're a public officer who has been posted outside Ghana, it means that you are still a resident person. So just to give you a gist of who a resident person, but so far as you be fit in the definition of a resident person, the law says that uh, the resident based taxation is uh, jurisdiction to tax catches you up. So where a person is resident in a, in a country, even the, like the instances that I've mentioned, uh, resident, they are taxed on their worldwide local and foreign income. So for example, a Ghanaian, if you have a, 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 a Ghanaian income tax is, is generally uh, is generally resident based, except for non-resident person, uh, which is taxed on source based within the country. What does the law say? If you're a resident in Ghana, and I've given you section 101 uh, standard, some of them, uh, it says that in the case of a resident, the income of that pe person from employment, business, and investment, whether or not the source of which the income is derived has ceased. All right, so so far as you are a resident, it doesn't matter where you earn your money from. It can be Afghanistan, you are still subject. Every year in April, we we'll go to the United States Embassy in Ghana and see they are queuing to go and file their taxes and pay their taxes. All right, so it doesn't matter where those people are. So far as they are US citizens, it doesn't matter where they are. They go and file their taxes and pay. And that is the concept Ghana has adopted. Right? So that is that. And where a person has a permanent establishment, uh, the income from that is connected to that permanent establishment is also subjected to tax, irrespective of the source of income. So, so far as you have a Ghanaian permanent establishment, it doesn't matter where that permanent establishment ends and income. But what is a permanent establishment? We are talking about an established office factory, warehouse, all right, anything. So far as it is not used for ancillary services, it is a, per a permanent establishment. And therefore, it doesn't matter where the income connected to that permanent establishment, it is subjected to tax. Now on the source base, uh, we are talking about uh, the case of a non-resident. So if you are a non-resident, then it means that you'll be taxed only when that income is sourced in Ghana. All right, so the section says that uh, in the context of our law, uh, section three, subsection, uh, uh, subsection is it one, subsection BI, three BI, says that the income of that person from employment, business, or investment for the year of accession, to the extent that that income has a source in Ghana. What do we mean by income having a source in Ghana? Income has a source in Ghana when it accrues in or is derived from this country. All right. So when we say accrue, we earn it, but it hasn't been paid to you. So it is taxable in Ghana. All right. Now, the last thing we want to look at is the sources of tax uh, rule in Ghana. We have parliament. Of course, uh, there is no power under the constitution, uh, above the constitution. The constitution is the sole act, uh, sorry, so the, 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 the mother law on the land, and it is the one that gives way to other acts to be established uh, for, the, for the income tax administrative uh, of it and the other. So the constitution gives way for enactment of tax laws. So we have the parliamentary enactment, and we have the court cases and rulings. Of course, uh, when there are issues, uh, uh, as you say here, uh, about mortgage interest. So it, the idea was that um, I've gone for a loan, buy a house, and the, the bankers are deducting interest. Okay. And you see, according to section nine, we are talking about expenses that are necessary, wholly exclusively, 
that for EPM. So I don't have a place to go. How do I work to produce an income? And therefore, if I've gone to borrow money to find a place to put my head so that I can generate income. And then, then the interest that they are deducting, uh, they are charging me has to be a deduction uh, for my employment. And it has been there, except that uh, the nation used to give these things for compiling. And the guy said that the, the interests are deducted from his salary per month. So why don't you also give me this relief per month? And he took them to court and he won. And he changed the tax law. So court cases and rulings are, 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 are grounds for tax loss. All right. If you read Alina Chia and Benjamin Kumbo's uh, uh, book, uh, you realize so many cases, uh, and it is coming from uh, K uh, law. So, like the root leg versus the inland in UK, uh, it's it's a source of law. All right. So, uh, tax source from law. All right. Then we have statement of practice and private uh, rulings by the Commissioner General. All right, so the Commissioner General is the CEO of GRE. And the Revenue Administrative Act says that for him to be able to achieve consistency in administering the tax laws, he issues things like practice. So a practice note is what he releases out to give his view about the law, okay? So his position about the law, okay? So for consistency, uh, and it's also for educating uh, and giving guidance to the application of the tax law. And the law says that it is binding on him because he does it in writing. It is binding on him, okay? So um, he uses it to explain and it's a source of ruling, all right? So there are certain things that are so ambiguous in the tax laws. The commissioner general gives his disposition on that and it is accepted as a tax law. When we are doing revenue administration, uh, probably in our third class, uh, these things will come to play. All right, then we have regulation. You heard me mention LI2244, income tax regulations. Uh, this comes from the minister, all right? The legislative instrument um, to regulate the income tax. So for example, we have the LI224 uh, for income tax. We have LI2243, uh, for VAT and we have LI2188 for regulating transfer price. And then we have international treaties. So of course, you know about DTS, uh, double taxation treaties. Uh, we take precedence over even our local laws that we've done when it comes to our relationship with other international uh, bodies or international So indeed, Ghana has this agreement with UK, France, Belgium, Italy, South Africa, um, Germany, Switzerland, and Netherlands, Denmark, Czech Republic, Singapore, and Mauritius. I don't know. I uh, think by now we've ratified uh, this one. All right. So that, that brings us to the end of uh, our first lecture. Uh, we hope to have the 11 more uh, to complete the series. Uh, so you have some past questions in here. All right. Um, I think uh, so. These ones are purely fiscal policy. We will deal with the uh, these ones next week, but as a way of guiding you to answer, it says that explain how taxation is used as a fiscal policy. All right. Uh, so we have majorly two policies. We have the fiscal policy, we have the monetary policy. And when we talk about fiscal policy, we are talking about the use of taxation and government spending, I mean, to regulate the economy in terms of demand and output. And employment. So for instance, if we all know that uh, we have contractionary and expansionary uh, expansionary fiscal uh, policy. So if the government wants to reduce money in the system, it will increase the tax so that the more you spend, it absorbs the money from the economy, right? And that is what they call contractionary, right? So he takes the money out, okay? So that, that is that. If the government wants to promote spending, what do you think you will do? You just reduce the tax rate. You just reduce the tax rate. So we have just two things under fiscal policy. We are talking about government spending and what a taxation, government borrowing, spending, and taxation. So three rather, borrowing, spending, and taxation. So he borrows to spend. 
All right, so you see that uh, uh, by borrowing or by spending, if the government wants to expand the economy, it spends more so that more money will get into the pocket of people. All right, so when he doesn't want to, when he wants to uh, contract the economy, he doesn't spend at all. And that is what we encountered. Government is not spending because there is no money, but government is taxing all forms of taxes, all right, just to collect money. And that is how you explain it. So we, we explain this kind of question using the contractionary and the expansionary. All right, we will look at this in our last lecture. All right, so that is that. Then we come to, it says identify for social impact of taxation. Yes, of course, uh, we are talking about using tax for so here we are looking at uh, the amenities, the social amenities. We are looking at education. We are looking at what? Uh, military, we are looking at health, all right? All these things uh, identify for social impact of these things, all right? So the social aspect of it, not political, all right? So these are, and they are in what we've outlined already. Government is going to create uh, a social uh, policy. We all know these policies. Um, it's going to come through um, taxation, needing the money to spend. Okay, so so basically, uh, that is that. So you talk about four, you are done. Um, in November, when we started the new syllabus, it says that economists are unanimous about the view of taxation as an essential tool for mobilizing resources for economic development in particularly uh, middle-income countries. Describe five purposes, taxation in an economy. We've discussed this. Uh, we talked about what? Raising revenue for projects. We talked about preventing the, the, the consumption of certain goods, protection of indigenous, uh, a balance of payments, with the redistribution of uh, wealth, uh, and, and bridging the income inequality. These are the five things that uh, and talk about. And he says that explain the use and the application of a task as a fiscal tool to stabilize the economy. It's this one too talks about the contractionary and the expansionary that I've explained. All right. So that is how it stabilizes the economy. If there is inflation, it's because prices are high. Okay. Prices are high. And prices are high, it can be high because of taxes. So if you reduce the taxes, it means uh, people can buy. But you need to understand inflation as more money or chasing fewer goods, therefore causing the prices to increase. So how does the government reducing the more money concept then by increasing the prices of things via the use of tax or reducing the money that people are using to chase via the use of tax and the vice versa, all right? So uh, you talk about the expansionary and the contractionary system all right so that that is that and in 2020 we have a, a tax system classified in many ways uh it could it could be based on the method used um in computation of tax it could also be based on the incidence and the responsibility like the direct and the indirect and here we are talking about progressive and uh, proportionate and progressive uh, it says that explain the structure um or uh classification of the Ghanaian tax system. So here you, you, we are, we use the uh, progressive, regressive, proportionate, all right? So uh, that, that is that is that. That is how it is structured, okay? That's all the percentages and all this. All right. And so here we come. Okay, so it says that explain the tax principles for the following resident. You, have we forgotten? Uh, we said that if you are a resident, it doesn't matter uh, a resident, it doesn't matter uh, whether the source of your income has ceased or not. So we are talking about if you're a resident, the income, the tax is on your accessible, uh, we tax, we source your accessible income from employment income uh, uh, and business investment, okay? Uh, irrespective of whether the source of with these revenues, where these revenues are and have ceased or not. So that is what, and we are talking about section three. All right, accessible income. So that is the point. And you also may make have to make mention of a Ghanaian permanent establishment. So regardless of whether where the Ghanaian permanent establishment and the income, which is also tax. So that is what you mentioned. About. And here he's talking about a resident individual. So that is it. Then you come to a non-resident person. 
you that one we said that it is stacked to the extent of which the money is sourced in Ghana and the definition of it being sourced in Ghana is what accrued in or what derived from Ghana. So that those are the things that we said. All right, then uh, question six, uh, which is the very last one, uh, is asking about uh, when introducing new tax system, developing an economy like Ghana, the contribution, and this is just last uh, uh, sitting. And it says that the contribution of the new taxes to be uh, bio, uh, buoyancy uh, um, of the country is important. However, it will depend on whether the new instrument will be progressive or progressive. Uh, uh, so explain progressive, the higher you end. Regressive, the higher you end, the lower you pay. And you have to give example. Is there a tax instrument in Ghana that the higher you earn, the lower that you pay? Uh, which one? Would you have? I know the higher you pay, the higher you earn, the higher you pay. But the higher you earn, the, higher, the lower you pay in Ghana. Not really come across that. And it also talks about uh, distinguish between the features of the direct. Do you, do you remember the table by definition? Uh, uh, this table that I showed you, that is your answer to that. I mean, so here, by definition, by nature, cost involved the burden, uh, chances of evasion, uh, the tax of taxes. All right, so you talk about them, you have the full mark. All right, so um, get prepared. This is the first of 12 lecture series to pass and get your highest mark in the taxation course, and I need you to um, work hard on it. Uh, so um, let's meet next time and start this car policy. You could see sir, that some of the questions have been even introduced to you already. So um, God bless you. All the best. Stay put, learn hard, and let's get the higher mark of this course. See you on our next lecture on this car. Bye-bye.